This is so exciting to see you all in real life. Whew. Welcome to WG Festival 2022, an evening with Netflix. On behalf of the Writers Guild Foundation, I want to thank you today for joining us as well as yesterday for our virtual day. Uh, it's our sixth year hosting this festival and we're, we love the opportunity, especially in these times to gather writers together to meet each other and learn from each other, you know, especially if there's wine involved after. <laughs> well, this event could not be possible without the hard work and help of the foundation staff, some of whom are here, and our amazing sponsors and partners, Netflix, Coverfly, and Script Anatomy. Thank you so much for your support. Now, please give a warm welcome to our host, Janelle Riley. Hey, everyone. My name is Janelle Riley. I'm the Deputy Awards and Features Editor at Variety. Thank you so much for joining us for this evening with Netflix. Uh, you are in for quite a special evening with creators and writers of some of Netflix's upcoming and most popular series. Um, First off, we have a preview of the new Netflix comedy series, Wednesday. Miles Millar and Alfred Goff are the showrunners, executive producers, and writers of the series. They're also behind some of today's most successful pop culture properties. They created and executive produced Smallville, which became the longest running comic book based series of all time and received critical acclaim throughout its run. Additional credits include working on the screenplays for Lethal Weapon 4, Spider-Man 2, and The Mummy, Tomb of the Dragon Emperor. Now they are the masterminds behind Wednesday, premiering in November. This series is focused on the beloved character, Wednesday Adams, putting her front and center for a sleuthing, supernaturally infused mystery charting Wednesdays' years as a student at Nevermore Academy. Moderating this panel will be Entertainment Weekly's senior editor, Samantha Highfill, but before we begin our conversation with the creators Miles Millar and Alfred Goff, here is the trailer for Wednesday. Hello, hello. Um, as she mentioned, I'm Sam Heifel from Entertainment Weekly, and I'm so excited to bring out the creators, the showrunners of this amazing show. We have Alfred Goff and Miles Millar. The first question is, how many times have you all seen that trailer? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> okay, I want to start at the beginning, which is just, how does this even come about? Where does this idea for Wednesday come from? Well, it was about four, three and a half years ago. Three and a half years ago, um, we just finished our, um, we'd, we were doing two shows, Into the Badlands and the Shannara Chronicles. One was in Auckland and one was in Dublin. So. We finally got back to LA, and we were kind of thinking what could what our what we wanted our next show to be, and we wanted to center it around a character, and we but an iconic character who we could sort of get under the hood, and of course, as you know, much of that IP is not available. <laughs> um, and then, you know, we thought about the Adams family, and we, you know, the movies we loved, and. You know the kind of the character really, because that the character of Wednesday that we all know is was really Christina Ricci and Paul Rudnick mm -hmm. created that character, because um, Wednesday wasn't like that before the before the show, so we had the idea, but we wanted to do a different chapter, and we didn't want her in the family mm -hmm. per se, so it was sort of teenage Wednesday Adams in boarding school was uh, was kind of the. <laughs> the six-word the six pitch. And we tracked down the rights, and MGM had them because they were doing the animated movies. Um, and so we talked to Steve Stark, who was the then president of production over there, and he really loved it. And then we did like a 12-page Bible. Yeah, we actually did the Bible before we spoke to him. We, before we spoke to so him. So we, we did the Bible by ourselves on spec and then sent the Bible to the executive at MGM. So that was, a, that was our intro into the thing. So it was doing the presenting them with this the opportunity, this is the show we want to do, what do you think? And they were on board. And then it was like a lot of hits and misses, near-death experiences actually, <laughs> uh, getting it to, to the point where they actually greenlit us writing the script without a sale, and then they greenlit a room also without a sale. So it was actually amazing that it survived, even though now it seems like a total no-brainer, right? It Tim was. Burton and 
and Wednesday Adams seems it still it seems to us like how do we not have like multiple bidders like huge it was literally Netflix was the only bidder and it was even then very difficult so it's amazing that it's that it's got this far after three and a half years we're sitting here yeah yeah well, when you're dealing with an iconic character, a family that people know, what were the conversations that you all had about like what aspects of Wednesday and of the Adams family that we already know should be part of this versus what you kind of want to put your own spin on? Well, I think the the key with this was we wanted to we didn't want to betray the character of Wednesday. Mm-hmm. It was like Wednesday had to be Wednesday. And, you know, a lot of times when you're doing these kinds of shows it's the protagonist doesn't know they are who they are and then they find out they're special and then they kind of bloom and you know come into their own and Wednesday isn't that person you know she she's somebody who knows exactly who she is she likes who she is you know we'd say she's someone who sees the world in black and white and through the course of the season and hopefully the series will learn that it's shades of gray but it's very small so very small it's, <laughs> so yeah. the, the challenge of the show is to how do we how do, how, how do we get an audience to emotionally engage with someone like this cuz yeah. on the surface she's really kind of unpleasant and difficult so she you know you really don't want Wednesday Adams as, as your friend yeah. um, so why do you want to spend 8 hours watching her so that's sort of the delightful challenge you know for us as writers how do we make it compelling and interesting obviously what makes it different is that she's very funny and i think that's the humor that's leavened the whole series really makes it special and stand out and that's something we both have teenage daughters as well and that's something that really like al's daughter in particular is very wednesday like so <laughs> yeah. we, we had like life experience to, to draw from so it was it was very cathartic actually writing this this morning how do your daughters feel about being wednesday's influence <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's very happy to be, yeah, so. Great. Okay, so, I mean, you talked a little bit about kind of the unusual process of this in terms of getting a room together and all of that, but once you you have, you know you're going for a full season, you're sitting down, what is the first step in the writing process for you all? Are you all outlining an entire season? Like, what's step one? Yeah, I mean, we're very outline-driven, and we spend a lot of time talking about story before we launch into script, so... That's our process as writers anyway. We spend a lot of time sitting you know, at the farmer's market working out what the beats of the story are going to be. And we've been doing that for 30 years. So it's still a process. And when we get into a writer's room, it's really working out the season, working out the beats of, of every episode very clearly so that there are no surprises. It doesn't mean there can, there can be surprises, but as you write, and it's an organic process, but it's very, it's, we really have a very clear picture of what, we, what we're doing. I was about to say, do you have to remain somewhat flexible throughout the season for those surprises, or are you guys pretty set when you start? Well, I think I think it's what you do is you kind of set out the roadmap. We say like so you know all the interstates. So then if you can find a back road, great. Mm-hmm. But especially because we'd never done a closed mystery show before either, and that's the thing that was. So you have to make sure you know in the who done it, who did it, and then how do you kind of then work backwards a little bit. On a, just on a plot mystery level and make sure that you have enough red herrings and you yeah, know how to it, bury it's the actually, lead. Yeah. Having never done one, it's never very, done very it. stressful. Yeah. <laughs> just because you think, oh, they're going to, they're going to know who it is. So it's like, if you cast this person, they're going to know who it is. Or like, you, you say too much, it's like, oh gosh. So it's actually trying to work through it and sometimes we realize that we have to add an extra beat because the person who did it couldn't do it. So it... it <laughs> yeah, you wanted, you wanted to make sure you're playing by the rules too. Sure. Like if you went back, and yes. once, once you've watched it and then go and you go, hey, wait a minute. And then, you know, it, it plays no, by no the rules. No Fight Club for yeah. us. Yeah, no, like, no Fight Club, exactly. Because <laughs> well, these fans will. They will go back and oh, watch. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. You guys might find out in a couple of months that you actually made a mistake. Oh, no. I have no doubt. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. I think now everyone's scared of the Starbucks moment in every show. We're like, oh, you know, we're so like... With, <laughs> Literally, we've been, our editors will be in big trouble if it's a, if it's a, if it's a cop in this, of these shots, so we'll see. <laughs> okay, let's talk casting. Specifically, were you all, in terms of finding your Wednesday, did you know of Jenna? Did you have her in mind? How did that come about? We, she was certainly on a list, and I can't say that I certainly didn't know who she was. My daughters knew who she was. <laughs> Um, but, but we cast a really wide net. And so we looked, you know, in America and Europe and Australia and, um, but, and cause she was also, she was shooting X down in, uh, New Zealand. So, so Miles and I had a zoom with her and she had been up all night 
Like, what was she doing running through the woods? Yeah, running through the woods, screaming, covered in blood. Yeah. So it was, it was actually kind of perfect, with this sort of setup. But she was very tired. Even so, she read the scene and was like, oh, my God. And we'd seen, like, you know, 200 people already. Um, and so we immediately called Tim. Because we, we were here. Tim was in London. Jenna was in New Zealand. So it was all, like, in the age of Zoom. It, it could happen. Yeah. And so we said, Tim, you've got to meet her. And he did. And he fell in love as well and was like... Uh, but it's weird in the age of doing auditions over Zoom. We could still all knew, though, that she was the one. Yeah. Um, well, you mentioned Tim. How did Tim get it? What is it like when you get that of, like, Tim Burton wants to be a part of this? It, it was... It was <laughs> yes, it was... We always wanted Tim. So we, at that point, we yeah, had but, written... Uh, yeah, sure. We all, yeah, we always we all wanted Steven him. Spielberg, too. But yeah. Yeah. it's like... <laughs> yeah. the, the reality, And again, like this, this whole process, the reality is you say, oh, would, Tim Burton would be amazing. And we have EP saying, guys, forget it. It's never going to happen. You're just never going to do TV. It's like, well, just ask. No. I was like, okay. Let's, let's, so anyway, it happened. So the, it, the script got to his agent and then it went to Tim. And literally four days later, he called, or his agent called and said, Tim loved it, wants to speak to you guys. Um, so we got on this, on this FaceTime because Tim, Tim didn't know how to do the Zooms. Didn't know how to do Zooms. They literally sent us Tim's number and said, oh FaceTime him tomorrow morning. In L.A. because it was an afternoon in London. Yeah, so he was actually in his, his house in Oxford, this amazing like garden with these life-size dinosaur models. So he's standing there on the on this, on this Zoom with his life-size with his dinosaurs behind him. Super on brand. Yeah, <laughs> saying how much he loved the script and was like he felt he would have dated Wednesday Adams in high school and she was his first crush. All, so all this like, okay, great. And then we later, and the first scene of the first episode, it, she sort of takes her revenge on this water polo team. And what we didn't know is that Tim went to Burbank High and had been in the water polo team. So it spoke even more, more fully to him than we had ever have imagined. Um, <laughs> that was a, we were like, were you bullied by the water polo team? Because no, I was on the water polo team. Yeah. <laughs> That's shocking. I know. <laughs> and then he sent us this article from like the late 70s from the Burbank newspaper about him on the water polo team. <laughs> wow. But he actually, he actually broke his arm playing water polo. And that's what sort of... He had to have time off, and that's when he really began to take his drawing seriously. Yeah. So it was actually fortuitous that he did break his arm. But it was anyway, it was amazing. He he literally he loved that we'd done TV before on Smallville, and and he'd, he he knew a Smallville, and he wanted he had, it was a, a sort of a security blanket for him in terms of he'd never done TV, but he loved the idea of doing long form storytelling. Telling a story of eight hours was really intriguing as a challenge. So literally, he said, "I want to do it." You know, you guys in, and then. That's how it, it happened. And most, for the first what, nine months, it was over Zoom. We'd speak to him every like, three or four days. And then we had a location scout trying to find where we should shoot this show. And it ended up in Romania, of all places, um, which turned out to be incredible, just in terms of that we had a huge, huge studio space, massive sound stages. And the whole thing was, was like, a, it felt like a building site or like a, it had been abandoned to time. It was like oh. dystopian. But it gave us enough space to build these huge sets, and Tim could have, you know, we built a whole town, Vermont town. It was just wild. But it was in the middle of the pandemic, and we had the the war in Ukraine happened, which is neighbors to Romania. So it was it was it was stressful. But um, <laughs> but it, I think hopefully no one can tell it was shot not in, not in America. It still has a spookiness as well, which I think Romania gave it. Yeah. Well, you mentioned that piranha scene, the kind of the intro to Wednesday in this series. And I'm so curious why, why you all wanted that as kind of the initial introduction to that character is her, it's her defending her brother and it's her doing something amazingly vicious. Well, we wanted to, I mean, cause the other discussion we had is do we set this in like a regular high school or not? And we, we ultimately decided we wanted her to go to what became Nevermore, you know, which is the kind of outcast boarding school. It's where her parents met because we wanted the show to still have that ethos of the Adams family and the idea that when you're a teenager and young adult, like your friends become kind of your new surrogate family. Mm -hmm. So, but we wanted to show her how did she get there, and that's where the Nancy Reagan high scene came in with the with the prime because you're right we wanted to see there's pugsley she's defending pugsley but it's a massive overreaction yeah, it's, it's pretty extreme <laughs> yeah. it's, and it, it's also comedic it's like yeah. it's sort of a wish fulfillment like what if like what if you put piranha in a pool what would happen what if they'd all die but i mean it feels like 
<laughs> yeah. Or one in, or like 30 in a pool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you all, we've talked about Wednesday and kind of drawing inspiration for that character. But then obviously you also have a lot of, you have an entire world you're building out of characters that you can completely create from your own imagination. Where did you guys draw inspiration from in terms of kind of building out the world of Nevermore? I think it just, we build it through character in terms of like, figuring out the individual characters who would be her friends and sort of the different types of people who would go there. Um, and then what would organically sh people she'd run into, like the, the, the sheriff. So it's sort of like the, the Scooby-Doo element of the show um, and building out the, the world of there are outcasts who go to Nevermore, sort of the vampires and werewolves, and then the normies who are people who, who, are, who are not sort of freaks of nature or <laughs> that's the kind of idea. And, and it was also trying to find the character she was going to have the most conflict with as well. We had learned this a, a long time ago, actually, from Gail Berman, who was a, who's a producer on this show, because um, she had very early on been a, t, you know, been a TV producer and stuff, and she, they always, she always talked about and run Fox, the network, and she always talked about triangles. What are the and not just love triangles, but like what are the triangles in the show? So it's like Wednesday Gomez Morticia, you know, Wednesday Enid thing you know Wednesday so it's just once you start to do that you you find like if you can find those interesting relationships you can then populate your world and as Miles said it's who she gonna have con also especially with Wednesdays who she gonna have conflict with and that, how funny was that gonna be <laughs> <laughs> well the uh the big kicker of your trailer is obviously Christina Ricci um how did that come about getting her on the show well that was always a dream and Tim had worked with her on Sleepy Hollow. But at the time, we couldn't make it work initially because she was doing uh, Yellow Jackets and also she was pregnant. So she wasn't gonna fly to Romania uh, to, to do a role. But it all worked out that we reworked the schedule and she came in after she had the baby and it was sort of a really uh, concentrated uh, schedule for her to shoot. But it was just amazing to see Jenna and Christina together in the same scene, the two Wednesdays. And I think, it, you know, on Smallville, we had Christopher Reeve come in the first season, which was a really significant moment for our series. And just the legacy of, of having someone like Christina come. So that really, for us, it's always about honoring the past, honoring the legacy of people and writers who've come before. So it just felt like the, you know, passing the torch. And it was really, it was incredible and really incredible. Well, I do also want to touch on, because a lot of people in this industry have writing partners, and obviously you all have been writing partners for years, had a lot of success. What do you feel like, were, like what is it about the two of you and your kind of partnership that works? Well, we were friends first. We met in film school, and we had, I think, similar tastes in, in movies. Um, and I think we just both had a really good work ethic, and I think the nice thing... And it's nice to have somebody to kind of go through this industry and career with, you know, because it's so soul crushing most of the time. So it's nice, to, it's nice to have a partner, and it's like and a friend where you, you know, and 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 but you know, a lot of people they can't afford to be writing partners anymore. We we've heard this a lot. Yeah, it's the economics of the modern era. And so you know, it used to be you're on a show for 22 episodes on TV, it's, it's a really good living. And now it's much more sort of hand to mouth in terms of what the work. So it's, we feel very lucky to be partners and we've, we've been doing it for almost 30 years. And it's, it is, as Al said, it's incredibly reassuring to have someone, not only to sit down and break stories, which is usually easier, I think to have someone who you can bat ideas around and, and uh, also motivate you. I mean, we're both sort of paranoid people in terms of like, we're never going to work again, so we need to keep working even harder than we are, um, which helps us. Uh, it annoys our wives, but helps us. Yeah. yeah. And we just, it's just, it's also, we have the very similar taste in terms of, and also we do different things in terms of when, you know, Al's very much dealing with executives and, you know, the writers, and I'm more a production person. And, um, so it's, it's, you really split your, your duties. Because I think if you, it can be very overwhelming if, it, if, as a showrunner, to do all of it. So two people really helps. Yeah, it's, it's always it's, and it's always been this way. It's the odd thing that you take the writer, the person, or people writing in a room by themselves, and at some point go, yeah, yeah, you should run the sixty million dollar startup business. <laughs> yeah, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> Here's business affairs. There's production. You know, and they just kind of throw you in. So. 
Um, what is your least favorite part of the writing process? Getting notes. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the best part is finishing the first draft, obviously. Yeah. That's just yeah. amazing. And then you get the notes. And then it's like, okay. And so they'd be great. I mean, we love getting really good notes. We love improving the script. The script's always evolving. It's never... Every, every, every stage is always about making it better, getting notes from the directors, the actors, everything on the set, in the edit room, always until it's really finished. Um, and then even then it's still like... This show we just finished two weeks ago. It's like, so it's always making sure and grinding and making sure it's the best it can be. Um, but yeah, it's that's that's the best bit and the worst bit is getting notes and it's actually bad notes. So, wow. yeah. <laughs> how do you balance? Because that's one thing with television. There are so many opinions. Whether we're talking about just like, there's a group of people in the writers' room. There's actors who sometimes have opinions. There's executive notes. There's all. There's directors. How do you balance that while kind of staying, trying to stay true to the story that you all know you want to tell? Well, I, I think the important thing is is you is that is you have to know the story you want to tell. And I think once you have that, um, because there is a flexibility to television that you, it, so you have to be open to, you know, other notes and things. But, but it's also the difference between what's an opinion and what's an actual note. You know, because some things you're like, they don't like this. Well, that's an opinion. That's sure. not. The, but, but, but that's it. I mean, we really, really love notes. I mean, yeah. we'd love to we'd take a note from anybody if it's a good one. Yeah. I mean, literally, we're, we're really open to any crew member, anybody, an actor, if it's, if it's going to be better. So yeah. it's, it's always about a lot of people aren't open. Or and, and you get, and to be honest with you, I, and I just think this is a, when you're a younger writer, and I think we were the same way, you're always more defensive because I think it comes from a fear of, oh, am I going to have an, another idea to, to fix it? So, and I think as you, as you do get older and you do it more, and frankly, you get things made so you kind of know what works and doesn't work. You just, there's, you're not so, I'm mean, like, it's a note. It's like, if it's a good note, we'll do it. We had a, when we were writing specs, we had people we'd give it to, and our rule was if three people had the same note, then it's definitely something that needed mm -hmm. to be addressed. Yeah. You know, yeah. so. All right. Yeah. Well, that's our time. Thank, well, you thank you guys so much. Thank, thank you, you all. Up next, we have Attica and Tembi Locke, the creators, executive producers, sisters, and writers of From Scratch. This limited series is an adaptation of Tembi's New York Times bestselling novel, From Scratch, a memoir of love, Sicily, and finding home, and premiered on Netflix in October. In addition to their successful release of the series, Attica and Tembi are both accomplished screenwriters, producers, and novelists. Attica is a former fellow at the Sundance Institute's Feature Filmmakers Lab, with credits that include Empire, When They See Us, and the Emmy-nominated Little Fires Everywhere, for which she won an NAACP Image Award for television writing. Tembi is also an accomplished actor with over 60 film and television credits, most recently holding a reoccurring role on Netflix's hit show Never Have I Ever. Moderating this panel, we have executive producer and showrunner Yvette Lee Bowser, who is the first and youngest black woman to create a hit television show, the iconic sitcom Living Single. Let's kick off with a clip from, from scratch. Hello, everybody. So, <laughs> full disclaimer, I'm here as a fan. <laughs> of these women and their work. I mean, seriously, ladies. I mean, your story, your vision, your execution, you delivered a delicious, gorgeous masterpiece. Seriously. <laughs> Thank you. And as we said out there, we would not be here if it weren't for you. Thank so you. thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yes. <laughs> no, seriously, for those of you who have seen this, I mean, like, you, you understand what I'm about to say, which is, it made me want to go to Italy. It made me want to brush up on Italian. It made me want to eat. And it made me want to fall in love all over again, mm -hmm. like until the end of time. I mean, there's just so many, so many layers to the love story that you've told here. So, Thank brava. You. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. it so much. Um, Tembi, I'm going to start with Tembi. Okay. Um, first of all, I mean, again, it's a beautiful series, but it's such a deeply personal story. It's based on your, your memoir. Um, what was it like watching this deeply personal story kind of unfold from the pages of your life? Well, I mean, definitely, I think the first moment was really day one in the writer's room, right? When I was like, okay, 
there's the book I wrote, and then there's the series we're going to write. <laughs> and those are two different things, but they have to have deep connective tissue. And so that was like the North Star, was always sort of making sure that we were always staying true to the heartbeat. When we got on set, and I started seeing it, the actors in 3D, in the costumes, inside the sets, it was so personally overwhelming. I was filled with humility and gratitude and tears and joy and awe, just sheer awe that we had accomplished this. Um, and now when I watch it, it just feels beautiful to have the world connect with our story. Because Attic and I, were, that was the thing that was most important to us, was like, someone said to me, you know, Art doesn't have to imitate life, but it does have to feel like life. Absolutely. And I think our show feels like life, and that makes me feel good. It definitely does that. It accomplishes that, and then more, and then some. Um, can you talk a bit about the adaptation process, given that the two of you have never written together? <laughs> never. <laughs> I mean, we but used to play together <laughs> as kids, but we'd never written anything together. And I think because I also write books, we had a very similar idea about what the adaptation meant. It meant that whatever existed between the covers of that book will exist between the covers of that book on a shelf. And we will extract from that what we need to make this show, which will be a wholly different thing. If I'm somebody who reads a lot of novels, and the thing about reading a ton of books a year, I don't remember the plot of all of them. I remember how I feel when I put it down. That's the thing that carries with me. And so we were trying to take that feeling yep. and translate that into um, story. So we knew that we did, were not going to be beholden to every single beat and every single fact of the book. And that the fact that we, we uh, were in agreement about that is a very big deal. Yep. And then we just started saying, well, what are the things from the book that we do want? And now let's build a series around that spine. And then from that, there were parts of my life that didn't make it into the book, but were perfect for the series. Like there was, there wasn't the space in the book because the book had a, a very, it was headed in a specific direction. Mm -hmm. I had 280 pages to, t uh, 200, <laughs> yeah, to tell it in. Um, but we knew that there were some things that had happened in life that Attic and I had experienced together that would be perfect to show in the series. Right. And so, what, what were some of those imperative things to make sure we're in the show? Well, we really wanted, even though it was this love story and you'd get swept away in, in the pilot, we wanted when you came to episode two, and I think Zora has a line that says, shit is getting real now. Mm -hmm. We wanted it, to, what does that feel like after the credits rolled on the rom-com when you really try to move in together as adults and somebody's from a different country, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. And so we really wanted to, even though there was gentle pushback about, oh, maybe why, why are we telling this story? But we wanted to tell the story of somebody as an immigrant in LA. And that is Lino's experience in the show. And that was very important to us to see the ways in which he was struggling. And frankly, that our main character wasn't really seeing it, that she was not really the best girlfriend for about 40 minutes of that episode. Um, <laughs> But that, that mattered. That's part of her growing up. That was part of the characters growing up. And then also the corn dogs. That was a, that's a real thing. My, my, I love the corn dogs. My brother-in-law really... How did you come up with this? He, yeah, no, he loved corn dogs. My brother-in-law thought that that was the best thing that America had ever done in right. the culinary space. And he really loved corn dogs. Right. So it was like fun stuff like it that. Was, those that were Easter eggs for us, but they right. also served story and served character. Right. And so I was like, yeah, let's, let's, let. and I remember when we broke it in the, when it came up in the writer's room and I was like, are we really going with the corn dog thing? I was like, okay, we're, and we played it all the way through. So it's, it's, it's wonderful. And I think the other thing about episode two that happens is you start to see the Zora character emerge to so the sisterhood storyline begins it. to, cause you don't know that that's going to be a, in the pilot, you're like, oh, okay, there's a sister who's calling her, but it really begins to emerge. And then there's that scene with Amy and Lino, I'm, I'm sorry, not Amy and Lino, with Zora and Lino, when you first see, oh, they both see each other. Yes, and, oh, when he maybe tells her they are. she's a good teacher. Yes. It's such and, a beautiful scene. And that has this arc that will pay, begin to like slow burn and pay mm -hmm. off later on. And those are things that that's not in the book, right? Mm -hmm. But it's perfect for, mm -hmm. for the series. Again, just, just another way that you're series shows us how we can love each other more deeply, more intimately. Yes. 
It's, it's so wonderful. So I know, I mean, since this is about writers and writing process, yes. <clears throat> you intimated you know, something about the gentle pushback. Can you, can you tell us what that looked like without getting too deep um, or in trouble? <laughs> it, it looks like notes. It looks like people seeing something that is unfamiliar and going, ah, well, I don't, I've never seen that before. So I'm uncomfortable, and my discomfort looks like maybe you change that just because I'm uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And what we try to do is create an atmosphere with both our producers and with our partners at Netflix to hang out in the discomfort with us. I'm uncomfortable too. I mean, you, <laughs> I thought I had so much money. I thought I was going to do this and that. I don't have it. Okay, so I'm uncomfortable. Hang out and you be uncomfortable too. I don't know how else to make art. But you, <laughs> if you go into it expecting this show with, with black Texans and rural Sicilians, you travel in here and you go in there to, God bless me, I'm in the house and I'm saying these things. <laughs> but it's not going to show up on the algorithm. It's not going to show up. Like, there's nothing about what we were trying to do that was going to, there was no path in the tech that was going to make you feel safe about it. Right. So I didn't feel safe because we were doing something big and, and, and expansive. We'd never done this before. And as a corporation, they were in some ways doing something that didn't feel safe either. Like, let's give these little girls, and one of them ain't run a show before, let's give them so many millions of dollars <laughs> and send them to Italy. So we were all having In the middle of feelings. a pandemic. In right. the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> we were all having our feelings, and I think that a lot of making this work was learning on both sides, and they did it, and we did it too. This process of collaboration, there are moments of discomfort. You have to learn how to tolerate them, wade through them, mine what's useful out of the moments of discomfort, and keep it moving. Yeah, I think some of the best art comes from those moments. It's yes. like, I kind of need to be scared and excited in equal yes. doses if yes. I'm even going to take on the challenge. Yes. And we, we also had to do a lot of cultural translation at different points. I mean, specifically, we have the Sicilian culture, and mm -hmm. I, which I know very intimately. And so on the page, some of like the small little moments might say, well, why do we need to see the mayor in the small town in Sicily? Like, what is, what, where is that story going? Where is that storyline going? And I... I thought, no, 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 no. I know there's a whole, especially on a, with a global platform, you're going to have your Italian audience who will see themselves in this. And there's a truth mm -hmm. to a small town. And, and it's, it's a thing. So there were ways that we were, and that's just one example. Um, and then certain, certainly on the page, trying to get the humor of a specific culture in mm -hmm. a specific place and time, you know, that doesn't always translate, but I was like, just wait, you'll see, you'll see. Look right. at the actors, it'll make sense, you know. So it was a, it was a, there was a lot of those kinds of conversations as right. well. Well, authenticity is always worth fighting for. Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, what was the most challenging episode to write? To write? Um, hmm. The, uh, I, well, because Marguerite McIntyre wrote episode seven, which is devastating and but I didn't have to do that. I had to, I had to work on it with her, but <laughs> right, I didn't have right. to do it. I felt the finale was very hard because when you're wrapping up a series, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to wrap it all up in a satisfying way. And also the finale, like I tried to, to, to explain to our partners, think of the pilot and the, and the finale as prologue and epilogue because it doesn't fit like a natural thing. Like suddenly all of a sudden Amy's in Sicily with all new characters. Like there was this fear that people were gonna tap out and be like, what, Why, what is happening? So there was that concern and that was, that made writing, I felt like writing the finale challenging. Yes, and we wrote the script in, there's three languages in the yes. script. Mm -hmm. Um, there's the bridge, the emotional bridge of Amy being deep in grief and how do we, you know, not, sort of short change that experience and sort of like, oh, by the end of the episode, she's fully healed and she's good and, you know, and all of that, right? You're like, okay, we, she has a gaping open, open emotional wound that we're going to have to let her hang out with at this, you know, for like at least the first 15 minutes or so of this episode. And I think that was, how do we do that in a way that's inviting, that's authentic and that also still has the propulsive plot beats that you need to sort of get through the episode. Mm -hmm. Also, one of the wonderful things about the show is it's, you know, the international quality, the culture clash. Can you tell us more about some of the challenges that went along with that and also some of the rewards that you felt from telling this beautiful 
diverse story. I'm going to start with the rewards because they are huge, which is I now have family in <laughs> Sicily. I now have people I love, people who love me. I began to really see that the thing Timby and I set out to do, that we had this idea very early on, that we wanted this show to go from eros to agape, that we wanted to touch every kind of love. And you might start with erotic love, bumping into a guy on the street. But by the time you get deeply entangled in these people's families and their challenges and the way those two families of very different cultures come together, you begin to touch on the agape love, which is universal, which is without language, without borders. And I begin to feel that with the actors and the crews. Like, I didn't speak Italian. I, I mean, I can say a couple of words, but not napkin. <laughs> this is a private joke that I cannot say the word napkin in Italian. No. Say but it. I, I, it. I tava No, you're not there. <laughs> Don't worry. Anyway, I found so much love, and still to this day, when, when Potty Day, who Pili Giacomo or Philomena, when we talk, we Instagram, we WhatsApp, it's like, I love you, you are family. That is the feeling that's there. So that was the absolute reward, is that you realize that human beings, our capacity for love across um, cultures is so big. Mm -hmm. It's so, uh, that was so rewarding. The, the challenges are the things we said, which is all the different, the, some of our actors spoke no English, the director didn't speak Italian. There were arguments about what region of Sicily the cast was from, because they were speaking different dialects. And in post, because Timby, you can kind of understand Sicilian, but you don't really speak it. In post, we were like, there was some ad libs. I was like, what did they say? <laughs> Oh, okay. And we got a translator in at the end, and they were like, there were like new lines of dialogue. Some of them were great, but I was like, I didn't write that, but okay. And there, there were also some unique production challenges and ways of doing things that you were yeah. sharing earlier. Yeah, I think that's I think, interesting. I think some of some of it was also the um, translating tone, right? So we were, I mean, we did extensive tone notes like for each mm -hmm. day of production because we understood that we were going for a specific kind of sense of humor or a particular tone in a scene that on the page you could play it really broad or you could play it really grief stricken like there were so many the striking that tone was very very important and that was always 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 a challenge and i know when our sicilian actors first arrived you know i remember having conversations with them because they were like is this sort of like you americans like us to be really broad and like have really big i was like no 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 this is not that this is not i need you to just be you and we would have like these b deep cultural conversations about their own lives so that they could see, oh, they're, they, we're, they, we're asking them to be themselves. We're not asking them to come to America and like do some sort of, you know, right. you know yeah, some sort of sticky thing. And, and also with gathering the humor of the family, the Wheeler family, mm -hmm. right? What is this black family's way of being like? You know, who's the sardonic one? Who is the gentle, <laughs> right? So that all of that, those were deep um, challenges that we sort of, we just found along the way. I mean, one, it happened a lot in casting. I mean, casting is so much of it. Yeah, I, I would say that the, we, we came out the gate like touching well, I, I'm trying to do a football analogy. <laughs> what's the, what's the uh, touch in the end zone? We, we were okay. within a toe of the end zone because of who we cast. You were in the red zone. That, <laughs> what she said. I don't know. I don't know. But we, we was going to get a touchdown. That's what I'm trying to say. We were going to get a touchdown <laughs> because, to get in there. because we had cast just incredible people who elevated what we'd already written who understood what we wrote, who knew where to pull it up, where to pull it down. Some of their ad libs were just fantastic. And it, it, it reiterated, to speak of process, it reiterated for me a belief that I don't think I'm ever going to be a showrunner who believes just say what's on the page. Because I feel like a lot gets lost that way. If, if somebody's deeply embodying a character in a way that it's not in my body, they may come out with some stuff that is dead on perfect. Mm -hmm. And I would have missed it if I had a rule that you can't say anything but exactly what I wrote. Yeah. So it, 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 we, we did well with casting. We're very, very lucky. Absolutely. And that actually leads to the next question about the casting process and particularly the sisters, the leads, um, and Lino. 
Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you landed on those particular actors, like what it was about their auditions that, that moved you or resonated with you? Do you so, want to start with Zoe? Do you want to? I, I'll, yeah, I can do that. Um, so Zoe came to us through Reese Witherspoon, actually. Um, Reese had dinner with her and her husband, who's and Italian. Her husband, who's Italian, <laughs> and so they were over, you know, dinner. In my mind, it's a fancy dinner somewhere fancy in LA. I don't know that it was. It's a Reese's house. It's a Reese's <laughs> house. Um, and Zoe and her husband are speaking Italian. Reese had just, um, you know, that we just partnered. She'd acquired the book, so she was very familiar with it. And so she's seeing Zoe speak Italian to her Italian husband, who was also an artist, and she's like, I think this might be the character. Um, <laughs> we got the call, and it was like, oh, yes, that makes, okay, yes, that makes absolute sense, because at that point, we hadn't even thought about, like, yeah. casting. Um, when we met Zoe and learned that she produces with her sisters, another synchronistic connection, mm -hmm. and also that she had experienced childhood loss as a child, and that was a story that she really wanted to explore. So between the Italian, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that intimate knowledge of the culture, as well as her own personal lived experience, she was perfect. With Lino, that, we knew we were looking for a unicorn. We talked about it in the writer's room. I was like, guys, we have to find a guy who's hot, <laughs> who speaks English, speaks Sicilian and Italian, mm -hmm. who can be stubborn but kind, who can like, <laughs> you know, be gentle but, you know, ironic. Like, what are we looking for? This is not, and he can't be an unknown. He's got to be, we got to discover him. And sure enough, we saw tapes from, I don't know, we saw like every Italian actor. Under a certain age. Yeah, 25 to 30, I think we saw them all. And when we saw his tape, Eugenio, I was, it was arresting because there's a physical resemblance. Hmm. Beyond the physical resemblance, there's he a, had those qualities. Yeah. He had that, he was like, he could be a little arrogant, but then he could be really tender. And um, it just, he was a gift. He was a gift. Yeah, yeah. and I, it was Serendipity. one of those where I knew from like the first few seconds of his audition, I was like, that is him. And so whatever I need to do to make everybody else know that that is him, and I had to sit there and twiddle my thumb sometimes and not say anything because it wasn't strategically appropriate to say anything. I was waiting to, for everyone to catch up with what I already knew. Right. Because he's our lead and everybody had, on the page, everybody had an idea of Lino. Everyone, when you read something, you you know, it's like your ideal. So it's like some people had that. And I was like, mm. and I knew as the person who lived it that I couldn't sort of wield that. I couldn't play that card, if you will, until I knew he was the perfect person. Um, and, and everybody knew. And when Zoe and Eugenio got together and they did their um, chemistry test oh, yeah. read together, it was obvious. I mean, we did all of this over Zoom, by the way. Of he'd never been to America. He had he, you know, he was a game. He I don't think really had done any television before this. And he got on the Zoom and he was like, I'm here. What do you need me to do? I mean, it was literally like, what do you what do you need me to do? We were like, we need to do everything and nail this because we want you to come to America and make this part. <laughs> you know? So he was and if you he can was see great. chemistry on Zoom, you yeah. know it's oh, gonna yeah, be yeah. really um, electric when they get And together. then the Danielle Dent baby. Come Danielle Dentwalder. Woo! Danielle. <laughs> Her tape rolled across, and I was like, now this is it. What are we even doing here? Like, this is it. And then me, you, and Nzinga got on a call. We were all so certain that we were done with the search completely that we were all kind of scared. Like, one, two, three, you say who it is. And then we all like, it's Danielle, it's Danielle. And then we, well, I will admit, we had a little bit of, again, seeing people differently on the page, where there were some people who thought, well, no, we thought, because Danielle plays... Or with a very wry kind of humor. And I think we are used to the sisters, the black sisters of very pretty people to have a little sass, have a little something, something. And she plays her stuff a little bit, her, her, it's, it's more cerebral and it yes. plays at a different level. And so I had to be like, well, y'all know that character's kind of sort of based on me. I mean, and I'm saying this is what I want, so can we. Right. Um, <laughs> and ultimately it became again, a chemistry read, it became 
patently obvious that you would have to be insane to not cast her. When it got to that chemistry, first of all, they, they are of a similar build to each other. They actually vaguely look alike. I mean, they have a different color, but they have a they have similar bone structure. And together, they were, they were laughing, they were crying, they were ch challenging each other. It just, I don't know, the gods shined on us. They did. And we were going to talk about the food, but I think they're going to tell me that it's time. Oh, oh we are. We can't talk about the food? Or we're going to wrap it up? Okay. The food is delicious, and it the makes you want to... It's delicious. It, it, it makes it's just you, another... It's one of the many love languages spoken in your yes. beautiful, beautiful series. Thank you so much for this thank gift you, to the world. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. Um, so this year, we actually bid adieu to two beloved Netflix comedies. Grace and Frankie, the longest-running Netflix series, aired its final season this year. And just a few days ago, Dead to Me's final episodes premiered on the service. Now, both series are rooted in female friendship, but also tackle issues such as age, loss, grief, and death, but all with a comedic touch. At the helm of these dynamic comedy series are Grace and Frankie creator, director, writer and executive producer Marta Kaufman, and Dead to Me creator, writer and executive producer Liz Feldman. So before Grace and Frankie, Marta Kaufman was probably best known for creating NBC's long-running hit Friends with David Crane. Additional credits include Georgia 5, Joey, Veronica's Closet, The Powers That Be, Call Me Crazy, a five film, and the documentary Seen All Red. In addition to her numerous accolades, Marta was awarded the 2016 Patty Chayefsky Laurel Award for Lifetime Achievement in Television Writing from the WGA. Liz Feldman is an award-winning writer who has carved a space for diverse voices within the entertainment industry. She began her career as a stand-up comedian before transitioning into a career as a writer, where her credits include Blue Collar TV, Hot in Cleveland, Two Broke Girls, The Ellen DeGeneres Show, and she also created the sitcom One Big Happy. Moderating this panel will be the amazing Variety Senior TV's Features Editor, Emily Longaretta. And before we begin the panel, let's take a look at clips from both Grace and Frankie and Dead to Me. I am Emily Longaretta from Variety, and I'm so excited to be hosting this panel today with two icons completely, uh, I know you guys can all agree, Marta Kaufman and Liz Feldman. Come on out. Perfect. Thank you guys so much for doing this today. I know everyone's very excited to hear from you. Um, I want to kind of start, as Janelle just mentioned, obviously both of your shows have been so beloved, and I want to know about the process for each of you when it comes to writing a show. Marta, let's talk with you. Let's start with you. Uh, um, well, at least that's not a large question. <laughs> you know, just a casual... Um, <laughs> You know, the process, it, it depends. The show very often tells you what the process is going to be. Um, you know, I have a process of wanting to do outlines um, and really know the story inside and out before, you know, you put it in final draft form. Um, and, you know, th the story, everything has to come from the story, but as... You also know when you have such strong actors, um, a lot of what happens comes from just the knowing of who they are and what they can bring to it. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't, that's not about how you create a show, that's more about how you keep a show functioning. Agree. <laughs> um, thank you for bearing with my mask. I had a baby six weeks ago. Um, so, <laughs> sure, I'll take it, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I agree, it's a, big, it's a big question, and I would say, in terms of keeping the show going, I tend to try to think of the story that overarches for the season, and I think of it from an emotional point of view, like, where do I want to start the characters, you know, emotionally, and where do I want them to get to by the end? And then I think about how to do that. What actions are they going to take, you know, from the things that they need and want to get them there? And absolutely, like what Marta said, when you have actresses like these, you also want to lean into their strengths. And, you know, on our show, 
Jen and Judy, you know, that's the heart of the show. It, that's the best stuff is when they're together. So for season three, I thought, well, how do I bring them together? And how do I allow them to play off of each other? Um, and hopefully, you know, complete an arc for both characters that gives them closure and, you know, reaches some sort of satisfying and, um, you know, whether it's the end, all the audience would choose or not. <laughs> I love saying that without spoiling anything, so appreciate that. <laughs> um, can I add one more thing? Of course. And, and I believe this very much to be true about your show, and I, I hope it to be true about mine, but I think these are characters that you'd like to get to know as people. You know, you yes. want to hang out with them. Um, if it's, you, well, know, you are the queen of that. That is you are the queen true. of creating characters that people want to hang out with. You did a pretty You're fucking good job. You're allowed to But but I do think that's part of what makes characters um, have longevity. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What was that process like for you wrapping up uh, wrapping up this show? Because Grace and Frankie wrapped up this year, and it was the longest original running show on Netflix. So what? How did that feel? Bittersweet. Um, you know, on the one hand, um, it was amazing that we had seven seasons and it was, every season was a blast. We had such a good time doing the show. Um, but a show also has a lifespan. And there comes a point where the show says, you know, I think it's time. I think it's time to move on to the next thing. Um, you know, the, the stories feel like they've been told and, you know, what's left is a little bit of desperation. Um, <laughs> so in order to avoid the desperation, leaving at a good time yeah. um, is, is highly recommended. <laughs> <laughs> well, Liz, obviously you can speak to that too, wrapping up this. Yes, and on a show like Dead to Me, you know, speaking of desperation, there's so much going on in terms of the plot and so many layers of story you know that are happening i just wanted to be sensitive to the fact that i uh wanted to keep the show feeling as grounded and authentic as possible even though it's extremely heightened and kind of insane and so um you know i i just always knew it was not going to be a seven season show first of all i'm, I'm no marta and, um, you know, but, but second of all, like, it just knew, it just, it felt it, like the show sort of told me, like, hey, listen, this is going to strain credulity if you keep trying to, you know, if there's another seven dead bodies, you know? So, um, <laughs> spoiler alert, less than seven people died this season. Um, so, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 you just sort of need to edit yourself, kind of, which is the hardest thing to do, um, but also leave people wanting more. Yeah. You know, I think that's I think that's the shows that stay with me are the shows that left at the right time because I I really wanted to know what happened next. Mm -hmm. And it'll just have to be what I think it happened next in my mind, you know, and right. that's sort of what I wanted to do for our audience. Well, Steve could have been a triplet. I mean, that could have been another chapter, another. <laughs> Emily, it came up in the writer's room. <laughs> it did. <laughs> well, let's talk a little about that knowing of when the right time to end it and how you know, those discussions go on in the writer's room. Are those people, are there people in your writer's room that were like, let's keep this going, let's do this, and you kind of went against that? Um, there were people saying, let's keep this going because nobody really wanted to do the hard work of <laughs> doing the end of a series. <laughs> um, no, honestly, everybody felt it. Yeah, Everybody felt it, and, you know, the, the hard part is not just feeling it and agreeing on it, because I think we all did. The hard part is doing it well. Ending a series is every bit as hard as starting a series. Um, and you want to leave people feeling satisfied and, and like they've gone somewhere with these characters and, and, and they've had some sort of um, relationship with them. And that's the hard part. How do you, I mean, we spent, we spent most of the pandemic trying to figure it out. Did you Same. add to that? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was just a bunch of writers in tiny boxes on Zoom being like, I don't fucking know. <laughs> this is really hard. But I, um, midway through shooting season two, the end kind of came to me. So I kind of knew that it had to be season three because it launches off of the finale of season two. 
And, you know, I do, there were, because it's, you know, a shorter run show, there definitely were folks that were like, can't you just maybe try to do four seasons? But I had this very sort of strong sense that this is how the show should end. And I just had to go with my instinct on that. And, um, you know, it felt to me that I just wanted to honor the themes of the show and, you know, not try to expand on them. It's, this is a show about grief and loss and forgiveness and friendship. And, you know, I just, I wanted it to remain that. And so it's hard to say anything more without giving it away. <laughs> we appreciate that. Um, one of the themes that runs through both of these shows is the power of female friendship and how the great loves of your lives are sometimes your friends or people that you don't necessarily think will be your friends that become that basically family. Why do you think right now those stories are so, they resonate so well with the audience? Marta, let's start with you. Um, honestly, because it's true and I don't, think people really talked about it a whole lot before mm -hmm. this. There were always, you know, shows were primarily, um, you know, you had a lot of romantic comedies and, and there were friendships. Um, but I can't think of a lot of shows that were about female friendships and the importance of female friendship, especially um, once you get to a certain point in your life. Um, you know, and, and there also comes a point, I think, where you realize what's important to you is people who will dig deep with you and tell you that you're full of crap and put their arms around you when you cry about it. Um, I think it was about time that these shows were on the air. And the truth is people identified with it. People identified with having female friendships and, and, and they craved them if they didn't have them. Um, and I think it's awesome. I think it's awesome. Um, yes, I, 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 everything that you said, Marta. And also, I mean, I think, look, the truth is that most of these shows were written by men before. And, um, you know, Marta is a icon here who uh, has, I just had to say this in front of everybody, you're the first female showrunner I ever knew about. And you're the person who made me think, oh shit, maybe I could do that, mm -hmm. you know? And, and it, it does Thank take, you. it does take people being able to tell their own stories. And, you know, women need to be able to tell their stories uh, about these relationships that are the most vital to them. And, it's it's almost like insane to me that it's a fresh take to be like female friendships are important, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like it's it's so crazy. Um, but also, I think that so much story is often born out of conflict, and you know, there's inherent conflict in romantic relationships that are not present in platonic relationships. So then it's up to the storyteller to find the rest of the story that exists outside of conflict and competition and cattiness and, mm -hmm. you know, so, um, you know, I think, I, I think I, I'm just extremely grateful, first of all, that Grace and Frankie existed so that I could say when I was pitching Dead to Me, it's like Grace and Frankie, <laughs> you know, only with murder, you know? <laughs> and, and I'm, yeah, so, so that's, yeah. And I, I think what you're saying is really interesting because it's also a lesson, I think, in, in scene writing where, you know, if you don't have characters who are necessarily in deep conflict with each other, how do you build the scene um, so that there is forward momentum and things happen and, you know, what may <clears throat> feel like sparring um, where actually something deeper is going on underneath. It's just, you, you still, even though there's no sexual conflict, um, you have to find a way for the scenes to remain interesting and compelling. And um, that's hard. It is, yeah. yeah. Definitely. Um, they always say, people always say, you know, to write what you know, and that's how you, how you become a good writer. Are you more of a Grace or Frankie? <laughs> we gotta know. A little bit of both. Hmm. I'm definitely a little bit of both. I've got I've got both parts. I've got the uh, I've definitely got the I'm fine part. <laughs> um, 
I also have a bit of the woo-woo, <laughs> definitely. Um, and I do like a good martini. <laughs> Liz, are you more of a Jen or a Judy? I'm more of a Frankie. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I am also both. That's the truth. I, I, when I was writing the pilot of um, Dead to Me, I was like really proud of myself. I didn't think I was writing myself into the show at all. And then like halfway through, I was like, ah, oh, fuck, I'm both. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I'm like, you know, I'm this sort of, you know, at least somebody who likes to think of themselves as tough. And I'm from Brooklyn, like Jen. And, you know, but I'm also somebody that has a bit of a bleeding heart like Judy and um, wants everybody else to be okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but I am also like Frankie. <laughs> We're all a little bit like Frankie, yeah. let's be honest. Um, Marna, you obviously have been known for such giant shows and you have this incredible legacy behind you. What do you hope the legacy of Dead to Me is? Dead to me. Dead to, I'm sorry. I'm Grace and Frankie. I'm like, please don't make her answer <laughs> oh, I that. I was really working on that. All right. You can also answer that if you'd like. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to, kind of like to know, but. Um. I, honestly, I think uh, dead to me. Um, <laughs> no, I'm serious. The legacy of that show has to do with A, women being funny, really funny, in the highest stake situations. And B, these are younger women going through insane things, and they're women. They're women. It's a show about these two fucked up women. <laughs> who just, they just, they, they mess up. <laughs> but they're so delicious. And I think you will hold on to that relationship between the two of them for a really long time. I know I, I find them absolutely delicious and think, wouldn't that be fun to have someone I could like go through murder stuff with? <laughs> Marta, I will go through murder stuff with you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for answering that. I wish I could have like a moment framed on my wall. Uh, but, well, I think the legacy of Grace and Frankie uh, please. is that there are, there is a huge audience for uh, a show about older women and that older women are still vital and funny and have shit to say and can carry a show and are hilarious and beautiful, and I will be honest with you, I have been approached like, do you have a Grace and Frankie? Like, do you have something for that audience? I mean, I don't think before you did that show, anybody would have thought that, because I do think once you get past a certain age, and I mean, honestly, I'm 45, I already feel like, you know, when you're women in your 40s, like that it's like, you know, you're already starting to become irrelevant. Um, and invisible a little bit, you know, you made women who are over 60 extremely visible. And that's a gift. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. I, do I want... also got to say, one thing I'm very proud of in this show is that no one ever talked about dry vaginas before us. <laughs> and I think it was about time. Well, when I said you were an icon, that's exactly what I was talking about. <laughs> well, I want to, I know we have to wrap up soon. I want to ask about writing for the incredible actors that you guys have on your show, because both of these shows are filled with so much talent. How enjoyable did that make the experience for you guys and being able to write for people that you know can deliver these lines and have this timing that is just incredible? It's the best. It's everything. Yeah. It's the best. I mean, I, we would sometimes sit at, at a table read, and I'd sit across the table from these extraordinary actors, and they would nail it. And I would just think, oh, I'm so lucky to be working with these incredible professional um, actors who are prepared and ask good questions and are collaborative um, and have you know, valuable input. Um, it was just, it was an absolute joy every day. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's to me, it's it's the difference between me sitting here or me being still at home trying to think of another show because, like, those actresses, Christina Applegate and Linda Cardellini and James Marsden and Diana Maria Riva, these brilliant actors, like, that's why the show connected. Mm -hmm. You know, you there, it's words on a page until somebody comes and brings it alive. And, like, you know, they they elevated the show from the first moment. This could have been a fucking crazy, you know, show that, like, you know, could have almost been a cartoon, you know, but they grounded it. They brought their humanity. And as soon as they started, you know, as soon as we started shooting the pilot, I just, like, was like, this is something because of them. Mm -hmm. And um, truly sitting, uh, you know, on the, in the producer's village, like, watching just on a monitor every day, like, that was, like, the greatest gift of my life, just, like, watching these incredibly talented women just pour their hearts into this show. And also, they are so funny. And, and you know, like Marta said, like, that's, like, I mean, it, it was just, it was a ball, you know, and, and, and truly a gift. Yeah. Well, I want to end on this. If you could go back to day one of Grace and Frankie, day one of Dead to Me, and tell yourself something, what would it be? Breathe. <laughs> that's a good. That's good advice. I would. I, I will take that, and I would say, hey, one day you're going to be sitting on a stage with Marta Kaufman, <laughs> talking about your show in the same you know context as one of her shows. I, I wouldn't have believed you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys both so much for being Very here. True. Yeah, seriously, give it up, guys. Thank you. Okay, so last but certainly not least, we're going to dive deep into the global phenomenon, Stranger Things. A love letter to the 80s classic genre films that captivated a generation, Stranger Things is created, executive produced, written, and directed by Matt and Ross Duffer. The fourth season of the hit series released this past summer and amassed 1.35 billion view hours, ranking as the most popular English language series on Netflix. In addition to their work on Stranger Things, they wrote and directed the horror thriller film Hidden and wrote as well as executive produced M. Night Shyamalan's hit television show Wayward Pines. This year, they announced the launch of their production company, Upside Down Pictures, which has multiple projects in development. Moderating our last panel for the evening will be Vanity Fair senior Hollywood correspondent Anthony Bresnikan. Let's take a look at a clip from Stranger Things 4 before Matt and Ross Duffer join us. Good evening, everyone. My name is Anthony Bresnikan. I'm a writer at, Enter at uh, Vanity Fair. And, uh, <laughs> whoops. Uh, please, uh, please welcome Matt and Ross Stuffer. <laughs> So we're in a writing state of mind today, uh, and, and that's what you guys are in the thick of at the moment for season five. Uh, uh, writers are always interested in the, how other writers work. W what rituals do you have? What is the process like of writing Stranger Things? Well, I would say it's, it's changed a bit over the years. I think, you know, it's always difficult. Um, it's probably the hardest part of the process for us. And I think just because, you know, everyone who writes knows it's just you, that blank page is so scary because it can be so many different things. And um, so for us, you know, the most important part starts right away, which is we have a very, you know, a small group of, of people that we trust of other writers. And that's, you know, that's really starting really broad for these big ideas. And you just, you just slowly, uh, slowly chip away one day at a time. Um, I mean, I think, I think that is the thing. It's like, it's, it, it, this, and when we were younger, when we were in our 20s and, and writing bad stuff, it was like, because we, we would get so excited about writing, we would dive in right away. So like, we're, we're really into now just slowing down. Um, um, this season in particular, we probably took longer just developing big ideas than we've ever taken before. And it just been a lot of time in the safe blue sky before you start to zoom in. And then we, and then we, then we like slowly zoom in, zoom in, zoom in until you finally get to the point where you're writing, 
individual scenes and you just try not to let it overwhelm you because it gets so overwhelming. Um, so uh, you take it a page at a time. How, how do you blue sky? Do you get together? Do you go for a walk? Do you play a game? Like what is it that, that you, you do, you use as the sort of uh, basis for uh, brainstorming? I mean, most of it because it is with the other writers were in this room, but I, I mean, I pace around a lot. Mm -hmm. We have lots of, toys around the writer's room and fidget toys and and sound machines we make we make sounds if, if people give bad pitches or good pitches oh, wow <laughs> yeah but it's a very comfortable group so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, i mean you have to have a little bit of fun with it uh -huh. like we have a couch we call it the snarf couch but it's, i don't know why but it was like if you have if everyone's excited about an idea but someone kind of raises their hand because they have an issue they have to go sit on that couch to raise that issue. So we do like stuff like that just to keep sane, keep, keep really. It. And it's, it's a small, it's only like four other people. Well, so it's you, like, it's you're banging your head against the wall so much. So we try to, we try to make it, and it's taken a while to f find this, this group that's the same as who was with us last year. It's a, so it's, a, you know, we all know each other really well um, at this point and everyone's, um, everyone's nice to one another, but we're also honest. And I think that that, um, that helps. Yeah, yeah, there's no fear in telling me and Ross we have bad ideas. No, no. It's like, it's established at this point that we throw out a lot of bad ideas. Everybody Everyone. throws out bad ideas. And there's nothing worse than like pitching idea and just being met with silence. Mm -hmm. So that's why we've added these sound machines. <laughs> <laughs> like ru rubber chickens, farts. I mean, we're like children. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but it, you know, I don't know. It helps. It's better than silence, I'm telling you. You know, but most writers I talk to say that key parts of the creative process don't happen when you're sitting down typing or when you're in a writer's room that sometimes it's waiting in line and buying your groceries or just sitting in traffic that your mind starts to wander or watching something on the news and seeing something that you think uh, that might be a piece of something I can use. Does that work that way individually for each of you? I would yeah. say so, yeah. I mean, it really, I mean, especially when, um, when we're stuck on something or at the very early stages like that to me is the most true when we're trying to come up with a new idea where that's you if you just sit down and go oh, i'm going to try to come up with a new movie idea show idea that's really um challenging and so that for me yes walking is a big one i mean most of like, stranger things we came up with just while on a walk around our, our yeah but it was also like we, it, we, we i think we we had just seen um Denis Villeneuve's Prisoners when we came out of that. So it was like, yeah, it can be something else that you watch that kind of inspires you that just gets something to click. But also, like, it's, um, I, I know, like, it was like, how many, doesn't Aaron Sorkin take like 10 showers a day or something? Showers are great. Because, like, it, it just, I don't know, your mind just kind of the gets in this weird. Reset your body and, like, <laughs> yeah. It's kind it was of just like, like uh, your computer on and off. I don't know. It's like you go into the weird stuff. It's the same as driving. And driving does the same thing. It sort of unlocks a subconscious part of your brain where, yeah, it, like Ross is saying, when you're just trying to like, oh, i got to figure this out, it's hard. But it does help to have um, people to bounce off of because it kind of works in a similar way in the sense that someone will say something and it'll just spark something that maybe is not the right idea. But it's it just a really wacky idea. Maybe it gets the chicken squeak, but <laughs> then it like, but it doesn't matter what we, that's why we like any ideas and we like people throwing out ideas and we like to throw out ideas even if they're wrong. And because it goes, it might be so outside the box that it just sparks something th that you weren't even thinking of. And that suddenly now you're running with it and you're running with the ball and it just frees everything up. That's when writing's fun. Most of the time it's just, banging your head against the wall is what it, what it feels like. And then, and then when we're actually writing, we just, Ross and I, um, it's mu music is what unlocks Sets the it mood. for me. Mo yeah, like non-lyric, like movie music. I've always done that, so. But what's really annoying is he started to, I do the music too when I'm writing, but now Matt has started to do it while we're directing, so while we're watching these scenes. But he can't hear anyone else because he's got these, you know, his AirPods in. Right. So I'm like, you know, I'm trying to talk to Matt about something, and he's just not even hasn't been listening to me. Get the chicken noise. Out. Yeah, maybe I should. I should bring the chicken to set, maybe. <laughs> With the last season, there there were some episodes that had a kind of, had a pretty epic feel individually, and I wondered if you could talk to us about the changing structure 
of what an episode of a TV show is today. In the old days, you had an hour to fill plus commercials. So you had whatever it was, 42, 45 minutes. You knew you had certain beats where you had to have an act end. And, 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 and now an episode can go long or it could be a little bit short. Uh, how did you figure out, you know, let's go a little long. Maybe the audience is there. They're invested in these characters. You have a lot of characters, a lot of story to, to get through. How, how did you uh, come to the, uh, uh, the conclusion that you could... You, you had a little more room to breathe with this season. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, because we, you know, we wrote for a Fox show, so we've read into ad breaks and we've read into very specific times before. And when we wrote the pilot for this, we did the same thing. And, and that's really how we did with season one. But I think what is, is so exciting, what's been exciting about Netflix to us is just the, that ability to experiment with what, what the form is and what you're doing, and you're and we've you know we've seen other shows do it, and I think that's to us that's there's something um, very freeing about it. As if you're a novelist and you're going to sit down, you're not going to write. You're not you don't have a you might have an idea how long it's going to be, but at the same time, there's a freedom that um, I don't television show creators haven't really had before. So um, we're not really thinking about it too much other than going, okay, what is, what is this, the story dictate? And what do, what do we think is the best way to tell this story? I mean, we, I, I'm pretty sure this is right. We were aiming for an hour, an episode. Mm -hmm. It's not like we were, let's, t <laughs> so we just failed <laughs> to oh, keep the story at an hour, an episode. Um, but anyway, so, so we, it wasn't super intentional, but at a certain point, yeah, it was, it was more about, it was like, it just becomes at a certain point about uh, for us about pacing. Is it pacing? Is it okay? So people are going to are they going to turn it off? Or are they still engaged? Is it a book? You're going to keep flipping the page. Um, so I'm I'm I don't know. I th I think it's really it's an exciting time to be working. But in TV. I agree. some of it is you're just stumbling into it. I mean, even season one, it was just just even we weren't really we were just writing for a television show, but then we would stumble in stuff. It was like, what if we just we, we didn't really have an ending. It was like Nancy crawls into the, a tree and we're like, I don't know, like, what is the end of this episode? We're like, just end it. And then, and then <laughs> hopefully people tune into the next one. And it's just, and it, it wasn't really a calculated thing, but we were just, we we're just experimenting a little bit with, with the form. You also did an inter interesting thing where uh, you split the season in, not in half, but uh, you split off the end, basically the ending of the season, uh, the final episodes, and and they ran. Uh, I forget what it was, a few weeks or a month after. It's like about it was a little a little over a month, maybe four, five Which weeks. I thought had had the interesting effect of you know people binge this show, it drops, and then they start watching all the episodes in a marathon sprint, and it it allowed everybody who, to to sort of catch up for the ending. Was that the thinking, or was was it more of a practical, like, we've got to finish effects, so we'll buy us a little more time? What was the yeah, reason for that split? It was, it, well, it was a couple, it was a couple things. Um, and it was, you know, it was, I, it was Ted who approached us with the idea. And um, I don't know, we thought it was a good idea. We were worried because of COVID. We were off for so long, and we wanted to get the show out as soon as possible. And this was a way to do that. Um, the, it's not like we were withholding the other episodes. The other episodes were not done. So it was a way to get them, you know, a lot of the show out. And then um, we thought the final two episodes would um, work almost as like a mega movie that we would release later. And so anyway, in that five weeks, we were finishing up the sound and visual effects and all this other, other post-production yeah, but it was really, I think there was a lot, we realized we wanted to get it out sooner, and then it was a debate of where, because we didn't, we hadn't written it like that for a specific break, and so there's just a lot of debate about where that is, and we just felt that Seven really sort of completed a story for part of it. The other discussion was for on on Dear Billy, but we then, it then felt like the second half was weighted too heavily, so it's very difficult. If we would do it again, we would... Um, you know, right to it. But I think what Matt's saying, I think one reason it worked is we finished, completed telling a, a part of, a big part of the story and then essentially you're saving what is, you know, in a, the third act for five weeks later and it allows people to talk and, and, and debate about it and, 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 and um, catch up with it together. And catch it up and, and talk about it. So it was, it was, um, it was interesting to, to watch, but also stressful in that it was strange in that 
we were still working on the show and people were discussing it, which is just something we hadn't had never experienced before. We were always moving on to the next season when the show was out. But it was also the other thing it was, you know, and when Ted brought it up, I thought it was such a good idea because it was, it was almost twice as long when we calculated the runtime as season three. So it was just, it was a lot. And I knew some of the like super fans and stuff were going to watch it all. They'll watch it all in a night. And I'm like, they're going to be sick. It's just too much. You don't want it's any too hospitalizations much. from space. Yeah, space. No. <laughs> I was like, that's not a good way. They're taking in too much. This took us three years. Like, I just, it's too much work for someone to devour in the night. Let's spread it out. I want to talk about your, your primary antagonist this past season, Vecna, who uh, I'm guessing was not in your mind when you first created the show. Uh, that this was something you came up, came up with later. And yet you found a way to weave him in almost uh, retroactively as a part of the story. Yeah, I mean, season, we were just shocked they were letting us make this show season one. So yeah. we weren't thinking really about telling a, a much longer uh, narrative. I mean, when we sold the show to Netflix, the, they asked, could this go on if it's successful? And we said, sure. And they're like, they said, how? And we said, well, Will was in this other dimension. He's not going to be feeling great. That was our pitch. And they're like, great, okay. That's fine. <laughs> uh, so that's really... And then I remember about ha halfway through writing season one, Netflix got a little... They, were, they kept asking all these mythology questions. And, and I think... And they said, can you just write something up to explain all of this to us so we can understand, like how the powers work where what is what is the upside down and all this and so we just wrote a really um probably overly complicated uh, i think it was about 12 page document talking about all the mythology and a lot of that even now as we're doing season five a lot of we're still revealing what was in that document in terms of the other dimension the other upside down so there are things from that were there were, there are things yeah from the put down on days. the page and yeah and I've been wanting to do the pinhead style villain, you know, since season two. I've just been pitching it and met with silence until or chicken finally. Sounds. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then, uh, so no, we've been wanting to do him for a while, and this was finally, um, you know, finally the year that we felt confident enough to pull it off. Um, what were some of the key things you felt you needed? Like, why did you feel the need to to, to make it so that actually Vecna is a part of this story from the very beginning? You just you, the viewer, didn't know that. Well, we've always, like Matt's saying, we've always wanted this sort of, um, a, a, an, you know, season one was really pitched, or what we thought saw of it as like the shark in Jaws, and that he's in this other world, and then he'll, drawn by blood, he'll comes up and he'll, and he'll grab some, and that's, but we always knew the second we started writing season two that we wanted something bigger that was controlling it something sentient and psychological and intelligent and something that you know especially we, someone that would be really scary for our characters to go up against because once they've gone up against just sort of these dumb monsters you need them you need we wanted to to up the ante if you will and so it's just something that um, something that's a little something more calculating, we, it, a little yeah. More. And it felt like we needed to do it to to both raise the stakes and then to give more of an emotional connection. Ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, with with our characters. So, is there anything you can share with us about the writing process that you're going through now on season five? Like, uh, did you have uh, obviously you're not going to reveal what the plot is, but did you have plot elements? already loaded, ready to go, or have you been sitting on those for a while, the way you were sitting on the, the Pinhead-style villain? Uh, how much is being created from whole cloth now that you've finished season four and have, have, well, have turned to fully to the writing of the new story? This we, was weird, right? Because yeah. it, it was like, th So because we had such a big break, um, we had to shut down production for half a year or a little longer. Um, we finished writing all of four and then we spent a long time with the writers and we outlined season five. Mm -hmm. We pitched it to Netflix. Then we shot for, edited for, released for, got all this feedback response, not just from, you know, from the, on the ground, you know, you learn a lot working with the actors and making the show and then from the fan response. And so then we spent a long time and, and we reread the document. We're like, that's cool, that's cool. That could be a lot better. That could be a lot better. And we spent a while. We rebroke it. We did a new outline. We repitched it 
to Netflix. Um, and even the ending's a little bit different. So it's, it's quite different, the two outlines. So it, it was, it was, it, cause we had never, we had never had a break a season before, before we had released a previous season and you just learned so much. Um, so a lot of the do, big, or... big ideas are the same, but the stuff that happens within is very different. Yeah. And weirdly, a lot of it, a lot of it is, some of it's that document from season one, and then some of it is, season two was crazy in that we, I think we were so, it was like the, the success of season one freaked us out, and then we we knew we needed to build up this bigger world, that this was going to be ongoing, and so us and the writers came up with so many ideas that we all thought was were going to be a part of season two, but it was way too much, like times times five more ideas than, than we needed or times 10. And so a lot of it is we're still pulling, even from season five, we're pulling from a lot of those those big um, um, season two ideas. So, because it was just almost like, seeing a blue sky, it's just like, what el- what, where else can this show go? And it's just, just it was just a, a whiteboard f- filled with, with ideas. And I think we're still cherry picking that. And I think a, a lot of our big ending stuff is pulled from stuff that we thought was going to be in season two. Uh, a lot of writing and creating too is, is problem solving, is you have an, a big idea and you know the characters have to get to that destination. What has to happen? A lot of your story evolves from that. And, and I wondered if you have ever, if you if can think or conjure any examples uh, where you, you have this world, you know it better than anyone, but, oh, you've discovered something about the Upside Down or the world of Stranger Things. It just, it's a perfect puzzle piece that fits right in. Is there anything about your own world that has like, snuck up and surprised you in that way? I don't know. It's that's sort of why we, you know, we started doing this because we wanted to get into movies and and why we've fallen in love with um, TV and long form is because it is so because by nature and film is the same way. It's very collaborative, but you can actually affect things as you're going. And uh, I think one of the biggest things we've learned is um, to. I mean, and that's affected the writing more than anything or the, the actors who get involved. So, um, and they change what happens in the story. And you don't, because in the same way that you don't want to fight what a character is doing. So if you, yeah, you want, you know, I need Hopper to go from A to B, but Hopper doesn't, it, you know, you know it feels wrong. Hopper doesn't want to go to B. And then you're like, okay, well, either you, put something in his way that makes him go to B, but then it feels contrived. So then you come up, the, the character will lead you to come up with something. That's exactly the what The story I mean. to go in a direction that you're not thinking. In the same way that the, the actors, um, the way like, say, Joe Keery plays Steve or the way Joe was playing Eddie, it affects, um, it affects the way you approach their scenes and it affects their character, the way Maya approached Robin. And then that in turn changes the character a little bit. And that changes um, the plot and where it's going, I would say. I think that's one reason we do love television is that it is, there is something a little organic about it, that it can keep shifting and moving and, and surprising. changing, surprising you. And, um, yeah, it's, it's been, yeah, it makes it fun. It's never, exa- it's not, it's, the show isn't even, even season one, it wasn't exactly what I had. It was, it's something completely different. And like, so part of the fun it of it is. Lives and breathes and takes over. At yeah. A point, it's like, it? I think of it, it's like, you're taking all these elements. You're like, I think that actor's interesting. That actor's interesting. That production designer is interesting. Those composers are interesting. That director is interesting. And then you kind of put it all into this cauldron or whatever. And then something comes out that's surprising you know and sometimes it's way you know sometimes it doesn't work and then sometimes it's um better than anything you ever thought it could be well thanks for opening up the process for us matt duffer and ross duffer thank thank you very much good luck with season five thank Thank you. you